Welcome to another edition of Celebrate Life. Actually, this is a special edition of Celebrate Life. We're, again, uh, blessed to have with us Roseanne Greco, and this is part two of Roseanne's <laughs> life. So um, as uh, if you have watched our first show, we ended with um, Roseanne's undergraduate school landlord suggesting uh, when Roseanne mentioned that she would like to go to graduate school, that one way to have it paid for would be to enlist in the service. And so we ran out of time after that first interview. So today we're going to pick up her life from that point <laughs> forward. And um, great to have you here again, Roseanne. And mm -hmm. thank you for uh, being on the show. Oh, well, th thank you. This is episode two. <laughs> episode two. <laughs> so take us from there. Yeah. So, wow, God. You think I was in my hundreds by this all this, <laughs> the life experiences. So at this point, at this point in the story, friends, um, uh, I did I did join the Air Force. I did, um, and I can't remember if we chatted last time. But when uh, Mrs. Sussman mentioned, you know, the military pays for your advanced degrees, I didn't. I wasn't aware that there were four branches of the military. So that's un how unconnected I was <laughs> with the military. Uh, and in those days, I you know, opened up the yellow pages uh, to find the recruiting office and, and uh, went down and I actually spoke with, with all four branches, uh, you know, Army, mm -hmm. Navy, Air Force and Marines. Um, uh, this was back in the um, uh, early 70s. So things were, were quite different as far as how the services wanted or didn't want women um, mm -hmm. in their, uh, in their uh, ranks. So um, the Air Force was the one that offered more opportunities for women than the other services. I mean, the Marines were looking for a few good men, Navy only if you were a nurse. Um, and uh, so it was between the Army and the Air Force and I picked the Air Force, um, which would be a long-winded story, which I'm not gonna go into. But um, so uh, I went down to officer training school. Um, I think I may have mentioned this in the past. I didn't know that there was a difference between officer and enlisted. Uh, I was oblivious as to how the military operated mm. because I had gotten my bachelor's, my recruiter, uh, I think he must have had his quota of enlisted people because he said to him, well, you you have a college degree. You know, you could go in as an officer. Um, didn't know what an officer was. But anyway, so I said, well, fine. Uh, and then I got into my um, my specialty. There's a name for it. I won't go into the acronyms, uh, which was intelligence. Um, lay folks think of that as spy work, which it is, mm -hmm. uh, because there were only three options I was given at the time. One was... Um, in the personnel field or um which i thought was more administrative uh, which it was and the mm -hmm. other one was in education we were you know uh, teaching which you know i was going to be in the, as a nun i thought nah i don't want to do that so i thought being a spy would be pretty cool so that's how i i went into um intelligence okay. um and so i was uh, in san antonio texas that was where officer training school was um I don't remember. Did I tell you about the Playgirl episode? Um, I don't okay. think so. Okay. So as you recall, in my earlier story, uh, I ran afoul in the convent. Um, all right. Well, I also initially, right in officer training school, which was 12 weeks, sort of ran into a troubled area with the military for the opposite, well, not the opposite reason, but my, my flight commander, and I, I only knew this because I have some of the guys came there are very very few women by the way mm. very few women um uh i think there were 20 of us in the class of hundreds 20 women but a friends came and said uh the captain doesn't think that you will be suited for the military because he believes you're too holy and the reason he thought that is that one of the first things we had to do was write a paper on our experiences with the first week or first few weeks of, of, of officer training school. And um, they had us do all kinds of stuff, you know, I mean, right. cleaning and stuff like that, making our bed. I can make a very, very good bed <laughs> to, this, to this day. Um, but my 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 um, uh, paper was about how easy it was. And I said in that paper, because I had been in a convent Right. And the stuff that happened that I had to do in the convent, I think I told you I was always doing toilets, cleaning toilets mm. with toothbrushes. And, and so I made some sort of remark about, this is a piece of cake. Um, 
And so he, he, that's how he learned I was in the convent. And that's how he came to the conclusion that because of that, I'd never make a, I'd never make it in the military. Hmm. So I had to somehow prove I was not good. And so what I did was in those days, there was a magazine called Playgirl. I do, do not know if it's still around. So I, I got a copy of Playgirl and I put it in my military textbooks. And we had a lot of classes where, you know, it was like an auditorium style. And I made sure the guys around me, when I opened my textbook, <laughs> saw the naked men and Playgirl in there so that they would think, well, she, she's not all that high in this and holy, holy. Uh, and, and anyway, oh my God. Um, so, Did it work? so I, so I, I got through that hurdle. I, I, I didn't do anything until, you know, I mean, it wasn't, the, but, but anyway, it was, yeah. so anyway, so I was commissioned um, a second Lieutenant and then I was sent to Thailand, which was my first assignment, uh, which was a, a, a incredible experience at the time. Mm. I, it was, well, first time, well, I was out of Scranton, Pennsylvania, but cause I had been to officer training school, but anyway, so, um, and then I, I had subsequent, um, assignments. My intention was only to be in there for four years. That's the commitment an officer makes. Right. And I figured I could get my master's degree in that time. And then I would get out and be a, you know, uh, what I thought, you know, was, I wanted to be a clinical psychologist. Um, and I did, so I went to night school, uh, because obviously I, I had a full-time job. And I did get my master's um, relatively quickly. Um, but when I was at the point where my commitment was up, that's the time when they they promote you. And promotion to captain, I was a second lieutenant, first lieutenant, is pretty automatic unless you do something really bad. And there's a huge pay increase. Hmm. And, and so the money that was coming in, I thought, whoa, hmm. you know, I don't know. I don't have any hmm. source of income and no job to go to. So I thought I'd stay in, you know, yep. while I was pursuing other, you know, seeing what I could do. So um, and then I never intended to make it a military career ever. I was in it, was in it for the money. Uh, I was in <laughs> it for, the, you know, to so the Uncle Sam would pay for my education. Right. And at every point where uh, I was thinking, okay, well now, uh, you know, now's the time to get out. I either was dating somebody I really liked, or I was in a location I really liked, mm. or I'd just been promoted, which was like, what, mm. promoting me? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so 29 years, four months, and four days later, I retire as a full colonel. Wow. Uh, now, uh, it, it, I, I, um, it was not easy. Uh, so I, I'm not going to try to... <clears throat> and this was a, a, a bed of roses because it certainly was not because in the military in those days, it's um, although I hear it's pretty bad for women now, it was not easy for a woman, mainly in those cases, because we were so new uh, and there were so few of us. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, I don't remember, but I think they were required to take women, you know, for some congressional reason or whatever. So it, it was uh, a case of um, in almost uh, almost all, but almost all initially until I became more of a senior officer, I was, um, they were, I was assigned to units that didn't want women. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I was, I remember one of them after I, uh, my first assignment after Thailand was in Omaha, Nebraska, at strategic air command. And I remember the boss I, I was going to, he said, he told me right out, we've never had a woman here. Uh, I don't want you, but I got to take you. Mm. Um, and so that, uh, so, I mean, but so that was the kind of stuff, but yeah. even when I became a Lieutenant Colonel, which is right before a uh, Colonel, the, the man I worked for, who was a Marine Colonel, this was in the Pentagon. Uh, you have, to, you have evaluations every, uh, every year. Um, yeah. and so we went in for my, my face to face, you know, uh, evaluation, it was closed door, he and I, and, and he said, I don't, and he said to me, I don't think women belong in the military. Mm. Um, and I said, what do you think about, and I forget how we refer to them. I think we said blacks. I don't think African-Americans because we worked, you know, side by side with people of different colors and stuff. And he said, well, as long as they're men. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm just telling you, those are the kind yeah. of the yeah. hurdles um, that went through, uh, you know, most of my career. And, and that wow. was before I got promoted to Colonel. Um, I was working for a guy who was to evaluate me on whether I was suitable. And that's how you got promoted through your evaluations, you know, gotcha. 
Uh, so uh, it, it was, uh, but now, so that was the, the stumbling um, mm -hmm. area. Um, uh, I also, by the way, formed groups of women, even when I was a second lieutenant, to band together because there were so few of us. And my, my like, I don't know, in <clears throat> or nun infused sense of social justice or whatever, always came to the forefront. And when I saw these things happening, uh, I knew it was unjust. I knew we were treated differently. Well, we were, mm. you know. Yep. Yep. Um, I mean, there were quotas on how many of us could be promoted, um, and, and, et cetera. Wow. So I formed groups of women all along the way um, so that we could support each other, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and do pushbacks. you got to be really careful in the military. Military is not a democracy. Right. Um, and so in, and also they can put you in jail, too, real easily. So it's not like a regular uh, employer and you can't quit. So um, right. but that helped to have the support of other women mm. um, who, and many we're all experienced the same thing. Sexual harassment was prevalent. Uh, mm. Oh, my God. You know, I've, I've been hit upon and pounced upon and, you know, wow. um, but um, I had good, remember my first story way back when I was a child? And, and, yep. uh, the, so I had developed skills <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and I had a knowledge base of, you know, yeah. um, these kind of things. And at that point, I became very savvy on how to extricate myself, you know, uh, through talking, you know, yep. I, I had a whole different lines, you know, whether I had BD or, you know, uh, sometimes that's, you know, um, you know I threw right. that out. I didn't, but, you know, yeah. um, but I mean, there were, there were ways I was, uh, so I, um, yes. you know, so uh, that was, Jeez. yeah. So um, that was my military career. Now, let me tell you the great part of the military career. Mm -hmm. There were lots of great parts. It taught me so much stuff that I do to this day. Um, it's it sort of tied in with the training in the convent about, um, uh, you know, uh, putting others before yourself, um, that you have a job, the mission, you have a job to do. That's paramount. You are not important. The mm -hmm. job is important. The mission is important. Mm -hmm. You do your best and you keep doing it. In the convent, it was perseverance and mm -hmm. fortification and let your, you know, you come last. In the, in the military, is very, very similar to that. Hmm. Excellence in all we do, you know, um, you know, the mission before um, yep. everything else. And so uh, that's probably, uh, probably that formed who I am today yeah. and why I am so darn persistent when I do things and stick mm -hmm. with them and try to do them well. I mean, mm. I learned some, some lessons in the military about, you know, uh, what we call not doing your homework, you know, yep. um, some pretty, pretty, as I look back, geez. Uh, you know where i was gonna i was like gonna have a presentation to the general and i hadn't fully vetted it and you know and it fell apart i mean i think that's some reasons why i didn't get promoted to general because i got poor evaluations because i hadn't done my homework and i couldn't answer the questions you know that mm -hmm. the general had or the the individual who was preparing it wasn't prepared yeah, that didn't yep. fly in the military. Yep. So those were things that um, I took away. I failed. I failed a lot. Oh my God! You know, if if I, I mean, I look like well, I am successful. You know, I was a full. Mm -hmm. I didn't get elected. I got elected city council. Blah blah blah. But boy, the failures were monumental and many more than the successes. Did um, the did the military see failure as an opportunity to learn? No. Oh, oh. no 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 no. They've come around now. No, no. In fact, it was usually one strike and you're out. Uh -huh. Because uh, I think they they have realized they were losing a lot of good people because if you make a mistake once and then you kick them out, you lost all, lost right. all the investment, you know, because, right. you know, that I'm very highly educated uh, thanks to the military. No, it used to be if you had one negative thing on your evaluation, it could prevent you from being promoted. In the military, it's up or mm. out. If you do not get promoted, you are out. And oh, wow. No, and you don't, you don't leave the military, even if you were in, uh, once again, things may have changed, but you get zero, nothing, no money at all if you don't make it to, in those days, it was a 20 years, all right? And they gave right. you, if you make it to 18, you got something. But if you, and I saw them do this, kick out people right before they reached 18 years in service and they left with nothing. 
No retirement. Nothing. Is what you're saying. No, yeah. no retirement. Nothing. Now, wow. the military did contribute to Social Security, but most of us, if after 18, you're not Social Security eligible at that right. age. Right. So, so yes, it was... Uh, yeah, and I got some bad reports, which which surprised the heck out of me when I was promoted. But actually, I was one of the best ones at my job. I always, mm. I always knew more because I I I went way into the details that the guys didn't have, and and the jobs I worked, looking back on it now, were incredible. Mm. Um, at the time, of course, I didn't have any basis of comparison, but um, once again, I never planned. Once again, I choose to stay where I was because of who I was dating, you know, or, you know, or where I was. And so I was in the Washington, D.C. area. I was dating somebody, can't remember who, um, but I wanted to stay in the Washington, D.C. area. So I was looking for a job. I was at Andrews Air Force Base at the time, and I was in social actions. And that's when I was doing racial and sexual harassment complaints. I was uh, anyway. And I want to stay in the area. And uh, uh, another woman, another uh, female woman, she said, well, she knew somebody who uh, who they were looking for a woman because they'd never had a woman before and they needed one to go into arms control. Mm-hmm. Didn't know anything about arms control. Uh, but anyway, I went in and I spoke to the the, the guy who is a, a Navy uh, commander and um, uh, and they chose me. And I think it's well, I don't know why. they. Well, I don't know. They chose me. Then I ended up not really paying attention to what the job was. Once again, I just wanted to stay in the area. I, I would have taken any job. Yep. I ended up on the START talks, the Strategic Arms Reduction Talks. Wow. And that was, these were right after SALT, Strategic Arm Limitations Talks. That was under Jimmy Carter. And Ronald Reagan was, was the president at the time. And he was renewing the nuclear weapons. And so I ended up in the office that... Um, ended that was on the delegation with the Soviets in in those days we called them Soviets yep. to produce a strategic nuclear weapons. Wow! Uh, and so I knew I know more I knew more about strategic nuclear weapons, uh, and I was actually toward the end called a recognized expert. Um, <laughs> and so. I was on the delegation that went to Geneva, Switzerland, multiple times to negotiate the reduction of nuclear weapons. Wow. And um, let me tell you, I get chills just talking about it because mm. I, I wasn't a back room. I was at the table. I mean, I was. Right. Uh, now, I was. There was the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador, the Soviet ambassador, all of the staff. And I was one of those people. If you ever see meetings in the, the back chair where they turn around and they want get, get in. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember sitting there, the only woman in the room. Wow. Uh, thinking, I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I am in Geneva, Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Negotiating oh, arms. Soviet generals and ambassadors. Wow. <laughs> and... And the other thing that was sort of humorous is because I was the only woman, I was always right there because the U.S. side was sort of pushing me up, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know oh, we got look, we got a woman. Um, the Soviets had no women whatsoever, yep. Yep. but I was an oddity, uh, and because we had a lot of social functions, you know, I was, you know, um, at social functions anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think I, I don't know, but I told you I got more in. Well, I better be careful what I say here. Anyway, uh, the Soviets yeah. talked to me a lot. You know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. men, um, all men. Uh, Interesting. I, get I was in. Anyway, so um, so I was doing that. And then later on, uh, I did other arms control negotiations. I was in uh, Vienna, Austria. And that was uh, to reduce uh, conventional weapons in Europe between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, which obviously. Wow. And then I was on another delegation and that was on anti-ballistic missiles. And that is the, the we used to have them. I don't want to get into too much military stuff. Mm-hmm. We negotiated, we, the U.S. negotiated with the Soviets about uh, treaties that we have signed. And this was on the anti-ballistic missile treaty. Um, so I had, and then wow. afterwards I had a job at the UN. Um, this is when I was working for Colin Powell, um, mm. the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon mm. on humanitarian issues wow. um, and, and getting supplies uh, to countries that were, you know, um, needed humanitarian assistance. Um, so, and there's more. Amazing. Amazing. So, 
Anyway, that's hey. another story. <laughs> Roseanne, a question for you. Um, did you ever supervise men in your oh, years of? All the time. How yeah. did it go? Mostly men. There weren't any anyway. Yeah. So, yes, I um, an officer is a supervisor <clears throat> right off. So <clears throat> I had, <clears throat> of course, I worked for men. <clears throat> I'm trying to think I ever worked for a woman. Oh, yes, I did. I, I did work for a, a woman at, at early on. But anyway, yes, yeah, so I worked for men and for women, very, very few women. I worked obviously with men, yeah. very few women. Yeah. And I supervised mostly men. And mm -hmm. then later on, as more women came in the service, women, um, women would often seek me out because especially when I became a senior officer, um, yes. as a mentor and advice. Um, so yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. How did that go? How did they respect you? Well, interesting. Uh, the women generally did. Um, yes. The, uh, yes. Um, the men, I mean, it was, it, you know, especially in the beginning, uh, early on, I remember <clears throat> sometimes, uh, I can't remember where I was, I was out walking with one of my sergeants and uh, we walked and somebody didn't salute me. I mean, you have to salute an mm. officer, right? right? He called him out. Uh, <clears throat> so, so I'm just giving you an example. There was sometimes... Yep. We, we yep. see the, you know, um, I had had men that didn't like being supervised by a woman. I had men who um, I who, you know, uh, they were my subordinates who wanted to who hit on me. Um, hmm. uh, so it was it was a, a vast array. Uh, yeah. Yep. As women became more as more of us came in the service the men got to know women and they work with them and we always the women always thought the problem with some of the other services especially the marines you know, uh who mm -hmm. and uh who didn't have very many women they were notoriously um adverse to having women and yeah, and yeah. had hard, bad uh, not good relationships with women is because they didn't work with them they didn't know them but right. i thought in the air force the more we worked together as a team Yep. the more they we got to know each other and respect each other we yep. had women had to work we had a rough uh, it, we had to prove ourselves every single time every single job we were transferred every three years yeah so you okay. go to a new job a new location every three years with new people and it was always starting from the premise that you don't know what you're doing hmm. um, whereas the men it was default of course they know what they're Interesting. Doing. So, yeah, wow. but the more the more we work, the more of us that were in there and worked together, the more accommodate, the more accepting the men yep. of the women. Gotcha. So okay, so twenty nine years, four months, and four days was that? <laughs> yes, that's what, that's what I get paid for, so I know. <laughs> my 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 retirement is based on twenty nine years, four months, and four days. <laughs> <laughs> and then what? What's what was the next so, chapter? So the reason I didn't go to 30, which is the maximum amount, uh, and I was up for general at that time. Uh, and let me tell you, I, I was still mouthing off and, and stating my, you know, concerns and issues, mostly about women's issues, but other things mm -hmm. too. Um, you know, I pissed off some generals, you know, maybe I would have made general had I stayed in, but uh, a defense contractor made me an offer I could not refuse. And um, <clears throat> it was one, I was a senior officer, so I had a lot of connections and I was, yep. I, I was very well respected and, <clears throat> you know, and from my knowledge and stuff, I don't know if people yep. like me personally, but whatever. No, I, I think some people, most people, eh, some people did, but, um, so they made me an offer and it was contingent on though, that I was hired before my security clearance would have lapsed. You have to renew your security. I had a very, very high security clearance <clears throat> and every few years you have to renew that or else it goes away and it's yep. uh, tens of thousands of dollars to get somebody cleared they do whole background investigations and stuff and that's that's money to a defense contractor sure. and they offered me so much money i almost fell off my chair um and thought do i want to go another eight months and then mm -hmm. uh and once again i didn't know what i was going to do right <laughs> you know, I go, right uh, what am i qualified for, for oh i can negotiate nuclear weapons all right is there somebody out there so uh i didn't think i had the skills because I was concentrate, I would do so, so much that specific work, but I didn't realize I had leadership skills and all that kind of stuff. So I, I took the defense contractor job, and that's why it's only 29 years, not 30 years. Uh, and I did um, a multiple things there, one of which was cybersecurity hmm. um, and learned a lot. I can't talk about anything, but yeah. um, 
uh, yeah, all, all of my jobs, almost all my jobs were top secret uh, in, in compartmented information. So I did that for a few years until I met my beloved husband, my now husband, um, uh, at a dance uh. and um, uh, taking ballroom dancing. So uh, <clears throat> so I, I stayed, I, I intended to to only work there for a while, but then uh, till I was vested, you know, and then I got, yep. Um, yep. Um, I didn't even know about this stuff. You know, they matched my, my, uh, you know, environment and stock, yeah, yeah, yeah. stock was yep. stock option stuff. Anyway, anyway, now that's why I'm living this luxurious home. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. What so brought that you, did, that, did you move to Vermont soon after that? Was yes. That? Oh, as soon, uh, as soon as my husband was able to retire from his job, he he gotcha. he had to say well, he was in um, <clears throat> uh, food industry. Uh, <clears throat> gotcha. uh, a store called Giant, and um, in in his he would not be eligible. Uh, well, he wouldn't get his pension unless he served his thirty. Well, served a uh, work yeah. for thirty years. And so yep. Uh, yep. after Higley and I got um, you know became a a, a couple um and decided we we're going to get married we we wanted we needed to wait uh, so we we lived in uh, we were living in Bowie Maryland at the time mm -hmm. and uh as soon as his 30 years was up then that's when we um uh well I had already told Higley I was moving to Vermont if he wanted to stay with me he had to come to Vermont <laughs> poor guy he wanted to retire in the southern area <laughs> um so so as soon as Higley was able to retire is when we went to my dream state the thing I the place I had dreamed about since I was a little girl um you is know. that right yes yes I, I'd, never been to, I'd never been to Vermont I'd been to Vermont once for a day um uh back in the hmm, gosh 80s I guess uh on a, on a trip to New Hampshire actually but we thought let's see what Vermont is like um right. No, as a little girl, I saw pictures of Vermont, uh, hmm. Pennsylvania, thought that was the most beautiful place in the world. Um, and uh, so anyway, and as an adult, I learned more about Vermont and its liberal attitude and caring for each other environmentally. And that's that's a really, really drew me to the state yep. is um, the, the stewardship of the environment and how it hmm. seemed to me. Uh, that Vermonters really understood and cherished the environment and protected it. And I thought, mm. that's what I want to be, you know, so. Yep. So, uh, yeah, so that's got us to Vermont. Yep. Oh, wonderful. So you got here and the city council that you were a member of in South Burlington mm -hmm. <clears throat> was, which seemed, when I think of your life, in many ways, brings together a lot of different parts of you, mm -hmm. that the social justice, <clears throat> the leadership, Caring about people. Um, tell me about running for office and choosing to run for office. That's yes, a big well, step. That was another one of these. Didn't plan for it. Didn't really think it through. I, if you if you if you've been listening to me, I, I don't really <laughs> sometimes a little tumbleweed, a yeah, human tumbleweed. That's right. That's right. So uh, after I got here, remember I, I I came here because of the environment, and then I started looking around, and I. Um, saw how they were building and it reminded me of most of the other places I've lived in particular yep. in Maryland, the most the place I lived most recently. And I was getting a bit concerned because I thought this didn't fit with what mm -hmm. I thought I knew of Vermont. So I was, once again, I'm pretty, I, through my life, I, I didn't know a lot. <laughs> But I did, then I learned a lot, and that's that's sort of what I realized. Yes. Military all the way up. So I thought I got to learn how city government works because I, I don't know how this is happening. So I started going to city meetings. I didn't have any idea what a city council was. I I, mm. I should be embarrassed to say that publicly, but I did not know what a city council was. I didn't know how cities were governed. So that's I started true. going to meetings, and um, yep. and in the course of that, I learned right. But I also learned that most people don't go to city meetings. I very often I was the only one in the audience or maybe one or two other people or yep. some people came to, to say things about their concern and then they would leave and I'd stay there, you know, because I wanted to hear everything. So um, they uh, some of the people um, uh, read. Well, I was there all the time. So uh, one of the city councilors at the time approached me and said, uh, there's an opening on the city council. The, the individual who was uh, in that seat is not running for it. Would, she asked me, would I consider uh, running for city council? And I remember once again, oh, God, I said, how much time commitment is it? 
<laughs> and she lied. No, she didn't lie. She said, <laughs> well, she said it's two meetings a month. And I thought to myself, well, I've been attending these city meetings, you know. I said, well, I, right. could do, I could do two meetings a month, you know. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. so. Right. So I thought, okay, well, how do I do this? And I learned you have to fill, you know, get in, you know, get signatures to be put on the ballot. And, right. and so I did that. And then um, I was hoping nobody would run against me. Uh, but a, 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 a man who was had been here for, I guess, 20 years, who was a small businessman, he, he ra ran against me. And um, mm -hmm. I had decided early on that I was not going to do the things that I saw. I was not going to do any lawn signs not going to do any flyers because of the mm. environmental impact i always thought oh how do you do all that stuff and flyers <laughs> are everywhere yeah so i thought what i'll do is i'll try to get my message out by writing letters or maybe getting people who know me to write letters this is a little bit before the social media this back in 20 uh, 2011. yep and people will read that that will be good enough it'll be the electronic transmission or in in news mm. Uh, who I am and what I stand for. And then there were candidate forums and stuff. I also didn't go door to door. Um, one, because I don't think I'm good one on one with people. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but uh, but South Burlington is a big city, but it's it's even bigger now. But I decided, and I didn't spend any money. Uh, I didn't take any contributions. Uh, some okay. people didn't. Nope, nope. Very <laughs> unconventional. Yeah, very. Un and so I took out, I think I took out three ads three ads in the local newspaper, in the the other paper, which yeah. I paid for, right? But the whole total thing came to $500 or something. I mean, we were <laughs> talk, not talking. Remember, I didn't have any lawn signs or flyers. That was my only expense was those those three ads. So, um, and I got elected. <laughs> I friggin', friggin' couldn't believe it. And my vote was one, two, three, four. I got 1,234 votes. And, no um, kidding. Wow. The other guy got 800 something. Um, wow. uh, but but anyway, so that was another surprise. Wow. <laughs> like every time I got promoted in the military, it was really? So um, so then I became a, a city councilor. There were there were five, there still are five city councilors in South in South Burlington. And um and doggone it, wouldn't you know that right after I got on the city council, well, the first thing I did in the city council was piss a lot of people off because I start speaking about the environment and about the destruction of the natural world through developments, housing developments, and how mm -hmm. how, how how I'm seeing what's happening, seeing happening in Vermont, what I've seen in, in, in this other states um, that I've lived in. Sure. And how detrimental it was and at that time i was not even thinking about climate change <clears throat> i was more thinking about the benefits of nature you know yep. the, the you know well the beauty uh, and um, open space uh, right right i mean for our soul I, I have now become much more informed that a tree is magnificent and beautiful and, and i always looked at it as from the aesthetics of of that but now i realize it's way beyond beauty you mm -hmm. know we will not be alive if we cut all our trees down and, and pave over our meadows and our forests because they are the ones that are keeping us alive. I just, yeah. just had a fun fact. I just learned that a mature tree, about 50 years old, provides enough oxygen for four human beings for an entire year. Wow. Remember, we get our oxygen. But anyway, so <clears throat> so I start talking about we got to stop this development. We, we got to. And somebody said, oh, what you need is interim zoning. Didn't know what interim zoning was. I do now. But mm -hmm. I mean, it was a pause to try to see how you are, how we are going forward as a city. The idea yep. was, and I had been a strategic, uh, among other jobs, a strategic planner for the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the military. So mm. I understood planning and I saw what South Burlington was not planning. We were just mm. doing without yeah. an end goal uh and if you don't know what your end goal is then you'll never know one if you achieve it right. uh, or if you're not meeting it or, or whatever so right. i thought i thought this was a, a time to plan to look around assess uh which is what we did all right so that pissed off a lot of people whoa I bet. Uh, mostly developers real estate yep. you know, the, the sm yep. business community that are very lined they do <clears throat> Well, I don't think they like me, but whatever. Um, and so that mired the city, uh, well, mired in controversy that I caused. Uh, but some, a lot of good came out of it. Um, but, but anyway, and then going into the next year, 2012, 
uh, is when they elected me the chair of the city council after having mm. been on the council for one year. Mm. And I had just been elected the chair of the city council when the Air Force came up with their environmental impact statement on the F-35. Right. I did not know anything about the F-35. When I retired the military, I retired. And I never wore my uniform again, except for two occasions. One, when I was in Washington, they were dedicating the Air Force Memorial. And two, when I ran for adjutant general a few years ago, um, related to the, the F-35. That's the only time I've worn my uniform since I retired. And I'm allowed yeah. to wear my uniform, by the way. That's no pro prohibition on that. Right. But um, I hung, you know, I said, no more military. I, I have done that. I want to focus on another, you know, other aspects, mm -hmm. primarily the environment. And the other counselors came to me and said, but you're the only one with military background. Mm -hmm. I, I understand the terminology. I, I mean, I, I understand the military. Right. And it made sense, you know, yeah. Yeah. for somebody else to take on the F-35. But yeah. so, um, so that started, um, I don't know, what year is it now? That was 2012, and we're still doing it. 10 um, years. Yeah. yeah, that's that started my um, efforts reluctantly at first to address the F-35 issue. And just as I did in every other thing I did, I read that entire report. Yep, I knew, very thorough. I knew early on, early on, I bet I knew more about the F-35 than the people at the guard. Yep. Uh, I, bet you, I bet you I did. Yep. Uh, I knew more than most people um, mm -hmm. because I did my homework and I read mm -hmm. the thing. And, and it was instant if you read it. Well, nobody will, but, you know, it was, I mean, it was about 6,000 pages. Wow. Um, and it was clear if you look at the facts, and this is where a lot of my frustration come, it still comes to this day, is I look at facts. That's what I've been trained to do. Mm -hmm. you get your emotions out of it. You get your subjective opinions. You don't yep. deal with that in the military. Um, you look at the facts and you make decisions based on the facts. And I, I naively thought, of course, they're not going to put this here. Look at what the facts say about right. the impact. It was right. overwhelming. It wasn't a nuance. Wow. I naively thought the facts would matter. I still naively, well, I'm not naive anymore. I also think the facts about climate change should matter. Uh, yeah. The facts that we should we should do this and not do this should matter. They don't. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, so uh, you know, I, I, I came out against the F-35. The city of South Burlington came out against the F-35. Uh, and then we had a change of council primarily because I think I, I well, primarily me, you know, and, and interim zoning and my stance on the F-35. And so the council was overturned. My seat wasn't up, so I, I was not... Um, defeated when my yeah. term was up my sentence <laughs> i chose not to run because i i realized at the time and i still think this i could do more on the outside mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, city council work is a, is a lot of work but anyway mm -hmm. and after i left the city council i sort of de facto became the leader of the opposition uh for the f-35 as the years went on as people dropped off of the fight yeah. uh we were hugely successful, hugely successful. Most people don't think that, but we were. We convinced the Air Force not to put the F-35 here. Mm. Uh, I know that for two reasons. One, I had a whistleblower that called me early on to tell me what was happening behind the scenes. I tried to make that information public. I was, the governor made fun of me. Um, you know, uh, who, who is this? You know, you tell us who told you this kind of stuff. And I kept right. saying, don't worry about who said it. We're, this is what they said. You know, once right. again, focus on the facts and you can verify. But anyway, so it wasn't until we sued the Air Force years later and they were they had to release their documentation uh, on the on the uh, what they did as they selected South Burlington that we mm -hmm. read in that documentation that the Air Force had, in fact, realized from for a number of reasons one from their own findings from the fa the facts i read that right. was not the place for the f-35 mm. when you put on the 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 thousand emails letters that they got from the people especially the people who lived in the area that were against right. overwhelmingly against it 88 percent or so mm -hmm. they put that together and they also looked at operational things, I'm not going to go into the details, and they came to the mm -hmm. conclusion that 
Burlington was not the place. They also realized they made a mistake. Huh. And that's the what? thing I was trying to make known early on. The Air Force right. made a mistake in how they scored the bases. Right. And Burlington was given a false high number. And that was so a, a, anyway, how did it that convinced the Air Force not to base it here? And then Senator Leahy called the head of the Air Force, the chief of staff of the Air Force, and said he wanted the F-35 in Vermont. And we had the F-35 in Vermont. Wow. Two years after they made the basing decision, we learned that the F-35 has been designated by the Pentagon as a nuclear weapons delivery vehicle. It's going to they're in fact they're they're building a brand new nuclear bomb just for the F-35. Mm -hmm. um, and when we learned that, which they never told us in the EIS, uh, mm -hmm. the environmental impact statement, it to me, it was, holy crap, this was my business in the military. I know nuclear weapons. I right. know nuclear war. I right. know what can happen. I know how you target. Right. Um, we try to make that known. That's hence when I ran for adjutant general to try to get that information out. And Senator Bernie Sanders had sabotaged that. Um, he came back and wrote a letter to the uh, to Montpelier because we were trying to get the the House and the Senate in Montpelier to ban the um, the basing of delivery vehicles, nuclear uh, weapons delivery vehicles, in uh, Vermont. The House, the Senate passed it. The House did not, mainly because Senator Sanders said, "What it was but back to don't don't listen to Rock Record." He didn't use my name. Don't listen to what they're saying. You know, right, they're right. not going to, you know, and so, of course, if a senator does that. And so mm -hmm. Senator Bernie mm -hmm. Sanders, Senator Pat Leahy are the reasons that we have the F-35 and the reasons they continue to be here and they do not need to be here. They can go uh, lots of other places. So did they anyway, was it the, was there a suggestion by the Air Force where it should go? Yeah, once actually, the they selected not a suggestion. They wrote the decision. It's called the record of decision. They wrote the record of decision for, for South Carolina. Wow. McIntyre, McIntyre Air Guard Base, South Carolina. Yep. That's wow. Yep. Wow. So, I mean, you can read it. I knew that before because the whistleblower told me that. But then the court documents that the Air Force had to release because the judge told them to release it. You read it in there. So it, it's mm. not hyper. I mean, it's mm. I mean, I'm mm. not making this up. But right. uh, anyway, so, you know, that was another great success and a great failure because you have to yes. here and people are suffering because of it. And Roseanne, a couple of times in the last few minutes, you mentioned that mm. Because of you, various things, you know, the interim zoning that, the, you know, but there's a lot of people that were right behind you supporting you. I mean, you weren't doing this alone in a oh, vacuum. Of course not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I just want you to alone. understand. Yeah, yeah. So appreciate that there's a lot of folks that you were speaking for. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it, what I find, uh, uh, what I learned in the military was leadership. What I find lacking in a lot of places is leadership. And it's because we don't realize we have power yeah. in our voices. Right. And I think it, it, you have to, well, I believe, you have to have somebody that um, leads other people to find their voices, to speak up. We have huge amounts of power. I, I've seen this throughout. Um, I remember when I was going to those city meetings early on, when I was the only one in the audience, they were talking about something. Uh, it was population, I think, uh, which is a few other issue. But, uh, and I, I was the only one in the audience and I, I raised my hand um, and I said, but you're phrasing it this way. What if you phrased it this way? And they go, oh yeah. And they changed it. And I thought, holy crap. Mm -hmm. They made a change to one of our city documents based on something I just said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, if I didn't know it before, is it was indicative that the right voice at the right time and is very powerful, but it becomes more powerful when you have a lot of voices at the right time speaking up. Um, remember right. the whole convent perseverance, persistence. You can't just speak up once. And um, it, you have to keep doing it, even right. even when you think you're redundant or they're they're you know they're gonna you know uh, dismiss you. You got to keep doing it because no. you know you know you know Those no are social change has ever happened exactly. um, without the people and persistence. Um, yes. So yeah, no, my gosh, of course I didn't do it by myself. So. Um, but I often come up with the ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and and often enough i get to work the ideas i come up with. <laughs> um, so so where so here you are today what what's what what's the next chapter of that roseanne greco's life okay so uh, I've been involved in lots of organizations, mostly environmentally focused and social justice focused. And I came to the conclusion of, uh, a few months back that I can't do it all. You know, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know I told you, did I tell you this motto, one of my mottos, you know, I told you the one about if you're careful enough, nothing bad or good will ever happen to you. Mm -hmm. The second motto I, 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 is, is that, and it's not for me, you know, it's, it goes back, is that I can't do everything, but I can do something. And I won't let what I can't do stop me from doing what I can. Well, and I find that I was involved in so many things yeah. and giving it little pieces. I was jumping from, you yeah. know, jump to cots, yep. to the food shelf, to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, all right. Yep. I decided, you know, in the remaining years of my life, which I'm hoping is 21 years if I did, my, uh, no, 31 years if I do my math, because 104 is when I intend to die. <laughs> I've got, I've got some time. Okay, so yep. how do I want to spend that time? And I decided the thing, and this goes back to, uh, uh, you know, uh, growing up as a little girl in the rural areas of Scranton, Pennsylvania, is that the environment and nature is part, well, we are nature, you know, but, but that is my passion. That has been my mm -hmm. passion for a long time. That's what prompted me to run for city council. The F-35 interjected itself and I was diverted, yep. you know, for many years. Yep. But I decided that's where I'm going to focus my attention. And um, the more, uh, I, and I'm really, really informed, as I always am, on environmental impacts, as in particular how we use or um, abuse our land. Mm -hmm. That has that has survival consequences for the human mm -hmm. species and so that's where i'm going to focus my attention mm -hmm. and that is right here in south burlington you know yep. think yep. local act local i can't do anything about the war in ukraine or the forest fires the tree cutting in the amazon and thinking about those and worrying it doesn't do a darn good thing it doesn't do anything but i can right. do something here in south burlington where yep. i live and yep. by the way changes are easier at a lower level at a municipal level so yeah. that's i'm focused on saving the land in south burlington gotcha. that's my focus that's what i that's, intend to, to debate the rest of my life for that's wonderful <laughs> roseanne what an arc of life that you know from your father who was the coal miner yeah. speaking of the environment yes fossil all, fuels. The, yeah. all the way to where you are today that's, that's yeah. a beautiful mm -hmm. yeah well, and I also do my own personal stuff too, by the way, you know, I, um, you know, we have d taken personal actions uh, in our way of living and, uh, and our house is net positive, not just net, net zero, net positive. Uh, I okay. have the, you know, through the, thank goodness for, you know, the military and the retirement income, I had the ability to have solar panels and, and heat yep. pumps and, and so forth. I uh, drop plug in car, um, you know, no gas powered utilities and stuff. So I've done, you know, that's wonderful. Stuff. And it, it's not an either or, by the way, you know, sometimes they make it seem, mm -hmm. you know, the big corporations have to do it, changing a light bulb, you know, it's both of us. If we both, if individuals don't do it and if big corporations and national levels don't do it, we're not going to, our children and ch grandchildren are not going to survive. And um, right. so right. anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. So we're at towards the end of our interview here. Yeah. Is there anything that about your life, about you, that you would like to share with the audience that we haven't touched on yet? Um, well, you know, the, my two mottos are, you know, that I, I, let me reiterate that because that sort of sums it up, you mm -hmm. know, um, and one other thing, and that is, you know, if you're careful enough, nothing bad or good will ever happen to you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, <clears throat> I can't do everything, but I can do something. I won't let what I can't do stop me from doing what I can. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I think is, is, has, I'm adding on to that is we have power. Individuals have power. Uh, we should not give up because uh, we think we have our voices too small or we're just one person. You know, I mean, think about the just one persons in the world. Yeah. You know, look what just one person, one person, they, they don't do it by themselves, of course. Right, right. But, but 
if we only will grasp our power and use it and use in and, and what I'm saying is our voices yep. um, that can transform the world. Um, I That's firmly wonderful. believe it. Yep. Think big, act bold, you know? Yep. Good for you. Well, you've done, and you've done some amazing things. I, I admire your work and your life, Roseanne. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Gary, um, for giving me this opportunity. It's, it's, um, you know, caused me to think about um, my life and 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 what comes next. You know, Good. and not Good. over. Please, God, no. No, we, we look God. forward to that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, again, thank you very much for being with us, and um, see you around the corner. Thanks, Gary. All thank right. You. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye bye.